name is Jamie Morgan Besser from the Australian Red Cross National Recovery Team and thank you again for joining us for today's webinar uh, entitled David Younger, Bushfire Recovery During COVID-19, Personal and Community Resilience. I wish to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land which we all meet today and I would also like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Now today's webinar is being presented by Australian Red Cross and Red Cross's recovery program is based upon the Australian National Disaster Recovery Principles and draws upon the community recovery handbook, research from the Beyond Bushfires research program, as well as our own domestic and international experience. Red Cross has been supporting the recovery of rural, regional, urban and Indigenous Australian communities post-disaster since 2006. Our recovery programs are all hazard, consequence focused and work closely with local services, all levels of government and community groups. As a result of this community-led approach, all of our recovery programs are reflective of the communities we work with. Red Cross adds value to recovery processes through having a trusted, neutral, independent role within communities that draws upon our unique national and international network of expertise, including other Red Cross national societies, academia, business and community organisations. Now, following the 2019-2020 bushfires, Red Cross is committed to a three-year recovery program across New South Wales, Victoria, Queensland and South Australia. Now, before I introduce our speaker, I would like to just cover a few housekeeping topics. Now, today's webinar is being recorded and we will share the link um, to the recording with you after this event. And we welcome you to revisit the content yourself. So it will be shared to the Disaster Recovery Webinars playlist on the Red Cross YouTube channel. We also invite your comments and questions. So if you can just have a look at your chat box there, uh, please feel free to add um, comments and questions as you see appropriate. And if you think of a question for David at any point, just type it there and I will either pose it to him at the time or hold it for the discussion portion at the end of the segment. Now, I'd like to introduce everyone to David Younger. Uh, David is a clinical uh, and consultant psychologist and has been working um, in the disaster recovery space since the Black Saturday bushfires in 2009. He's worked in a variety of settings and is passionate about people, assisting people improve health and wellness. Now, in addition to his private practice, David consults to the emergency management and private sectors. And he focuses on the provision of training and development, community recovery and consultation, as well as driving innovation. Preparedness, resilience building, the role of community in recovery, self-care and trauma recovery are integral to service delivery. So I might leave it there and hand over to David. Thank you so much for joining us, David. Please take it away. Yeah, thanks, Jamie. Um, and thank you to everyone out there in the communities throughout Australia um, who's decided to tune in to this particular webinar. You know, we really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy day and creating the space over the next hour and a half, two hours to just be a part of this. Um, thanks to Jamie for the intro there. And, you know, really what, what I want to emphasize at the outset is that, you know, I really am just coming to you to share information as best I can. Um, you know, I haven't visited all of your unique individual communities. I haven't had that opportunity to, of course, because of the circumstances at the moment in our country. Um, but what I do want to do is to share with you uh, many of the common things that we've come to know and understand quite well about what individuals, uh, communities, families, couples, children um, experience. You know, when they go through something like a significant disaster or emergency. So uh, I want to spend a bit of time working through that with you in this particular session um, and also work to make it as you know, possibly as open and conversation as possible. So look, I'm certainly not going to just talk at you non-stop for the next two hours. Um, there are four main sections to this particular webinar. I'm going to keep them sort of relatively brief in terms of my talking um, and then we're going to work to leave some time at the end of each session for questions, discussion, chat, conversation. So, you know, as much as you possibly can use it as an opportunity to ask things that have been on your mind um, and I and we will do our best to, to respond to them. Um, let's just also remember in these sessions, you know, the importance of respect, collaboration, having good supports in your life and, you know, very importantly in situations like this, working to uh, maintain as optimistic and, and outlook as we possibly can, despite working through very tough times at the moment. Um, there's been a lot happened in Australia um, in the last six months in a very short period of time. Of 
caused the really, really significant fire events, uh, which went for an extended period, which was quite unprecedented earlier this year and actually um, before the Christmas New Year period, of course, in New South Wales, starting September, October-ish. Um, and for some communities, unfortunately, off the back of a period of an extended drought. Um, and right now, and of course, over the last three to five months, COVID-19. And, you know, these issues in and of themselves, these emergencies, um, they bring with them a complexity of issues. And in this first section today, um, I'm going to talk with you about some of the common effects um, that we know occur for communities. So, in fact, these four sections that I'm going to talk to you about, um, first section, I just want to uh, talk to you about key effects and relate that to the recovery cycle and what we tend to see happen across the course of the first 12 months and beyond. Um, secondly, talk to you about in a little bit more detail, stress, family and children, and you know, just work to help you understand why it can be uh, starting to feel so hard at this point. Um, thirdly, look at and just help you understand and examine a bit more closely key features of bushfire, drought and COVID, you know, and really be able to take those key features and apply them to your lives at the moment. And then fourthly, and by no means least, talk to you about the importance of self-care, connection and well-being. Um, and you'll hear me use a range of different phrases which have been being used throughout uh, in communities um, throughout Australia for a number of years now. Um, and these key phrases can help you remember key points. So. One of those is about conserving energy to run a marathon as opposed to a sprint, uh, because what's occurring at the moment will unfortunately probably go for a bit of time yet. So let's move into this first section uh, about understanding recovery. Um, and I'll even just sort of say at the outset, recovery is a word that we're going to come to have a look at and talk about a little bit further down the track in this particular section. But um, I, I just want to talk to you about the first 12 months and beyond and mention that, you know, this is a period of time where certainly this point in time, you know, it's the middle of the year, uh, it's July, we're heading into winter, you know, for communities it's been approximately six months since those bushfire events earlier on in the year. For some communities actually it's longer than six months um, and as I mentioned before, you know, COVID-19 has um, emerged and has come about. So. It's not at all unusual um, for people in affected communities to start to find that now it's beginning to feel quite hard and quite difficult. And in fact, what's been coming through to, to me and to us from many communities because of COVID and in particular the bushfire affected communities is that they're feeling like COVID has really taken over, you know, and therefore starting to feel like they've been a bit forgotten. Um, but, you know, we know and really do realise that many people out there and many communities out there are doing it tough. Now, ordinarily, and in a non-COVID-19 sort of situation, um, I would have the privilege of being able to come out face to face um, and spend time in a community, talking to a community. Often what we do is we run face to face community information sessions. Um, and I probably would have had an opportunity to, to sort of mingle and talk to people um, and listen to their stories, their first-hand stories and experiences. Um, and then when we move to the speaking part, I would start to talk about key effects of natural disasters, but also drought and pandemics. So that's what I want to do now, but in this webinar format. Um, and I'll just sort of give you the heads up. You know, if some people might be taking notes, you certainly don't have to. But if you want to, um, the key effects that I'm going to talk to you about are disruption, loss, stress, financial consequences, and health and well-being. They're the key effects I'm going to mention to you in this first section. And then I'm going to show you a little diagram, um, a, yeah, a little diagram that just highlights, um, you know, really the up and down roller coaster uh, that recovery can be for people, unfortunately. So disruption to life, you know, you might be thinking, what on earth do I mean by that? Well, you know, look, a starting point is to say to you, um, think back to what life was like six to nine months ago. Just think back for a moment, reflect on what your life was like and see if you can remember what normal, if we use that word, daily life was like. And um, 
you know, I've just sort of asked you to do that because we talk about what's normal and what isn't normal, but in a very, very broad sense, we can start to realise that normal daily lives um, are actually held together by habits and routines. So, you know, if I think about a normal, ordinary life, you know, I can start to think that there is um, there's waking up in the morning, there's then getting up and making breakfast, there's getting ready for work, there's getting kids ready for school, there's a, a drop-off, etc. cetera. Um, but there's this process that we all go through and it's a process that we don't have to give much thought to. It happens very, very automatically. And that process is actually underlined by habits and routines. And habits and routines actually play a very important role in our day-to-day -day lives um, because what they do is they provide a sense of predictability, uh, a sense of certainty, and ultimately a sense of safety. But the thing is when significant things occur in life, like disasters, typically there's disruption to that pre-existing certainty and stability. In fact, the routines, they, um, at a minimum, they can be disrupted, but sometimes they're completely blown apart. Um, and the disruption can be minor or major, or it can be short or long-term. Um, you know, often I give examples and tell stories uh, of examples of disruption. But let me just mention two that come to mind briefly. Um, one relates to a far north Queensland town that we visited some years ago after tropical cyclone Debbie, uh, which as a result of the cyclone had the main road which connected the township on a ridge with another township at the base where there was also the large shopping centre and all of the relevant facilities. That road was actually washed away uh, by the cyclone, you know, the significant rainfall and the mudslides that followed. And the result of that was that people's trip community members trip off the ridge down to that township where there was also a school was extended by about 40 minutes each way. What was ordinarily a 20 minute trip in the car became 60 minutes. Um, and so all of a sudden, as a result of this particular cyclone, you know, people were spending two hours in the car, you know, taking kids to school or going to the shops. Now that's just a very small example of disruption to routines. Um, another that comes to mind is a, a farmer I spoke to once in New South Wales who as a result of fires um, had lost a significant amount of fencing and uh, so his cattle was being sort of adjusted at another property and the result of that was that every day after his normal work day he then had to travel an additional period of time to the cattle where they were being adjusted and sort of tend to them but there was also the ongoing work and repair defensive so he could bring the cattle back so these are examples of disruption to life. And what disruption does is at a minimum, it creates stress in life, um, but it can certainly affect a lot more than stress. Stress can become anxiety and anxiety can wear people out and cause them to feel tired. So that brings me to a second um, effect of disasters, uh, whether that's a bushfire or a flood or whether that's COVID or drought, and that is stress. And I just want to touch on briefly, but I'll expand on this in a, a bit more shortly, two types of stress. Um, and again, you might be wondering, why do I bring up this word stress? You, know, you might think we know what stress is, but I want to mention to you that there are two very specific types of stress, which we know do typically affect people in the aftermath of a bushfire uh, or an emergency, um, and also play a significant role across the course of the first couple of years. So the first type of stress that we talk about is called survival mode. And survival mode is driven by adrenaline. Um, adrenaline is what gives us access to a lot of energy in a very short period of time, essentially to face a very threatening situation. And I have the example of a bushfire here. Um, now, survival mode gets activated very automatically by a whole series of mechanisms within our body without us needing to think about it, it just happens and it is our body doing what it's supposed to do. It's our body adapting to an imminent threat. And the entire purpose of going into survival mode and you know, there'll be a significant proportion of you out there who have already been into survival mode, either as a result of recent events or at some other time in your life. Um, the whole purpose of survival mode is to increase the chance of survival and remaining safe. Now, ordinarily when things pass, uh, when the immediate threat is passed, survival mode turns itself off. It's a bit like the dimmer switch 
uh, on a light switch, it will turn off and we'll return to a healthy state of function. But survival mode is running is like running a 100 meter sprint. Um, endurance mode is the second state of stress that occurs. And endurance mode is like running m multiple marathons, one after another, one after another, one after another. And many community members tell us that the first 12 months, the second 12 months, and in fact, a lot of recovery becomes like an endurance mode where they're just running a marathon. And that's because there are just a lot of things often to do over and above what would ordinarily need to be uh, done in life on top of work, uh, on top of looking after kids, on top of looking after a property. And this comes from the disruption. Now, endurance is driven by cortisol. That's a different chemical in the body. But cortisol gives us access to energy we wouldn't otherwise get access to. Um, and it enables us to keep going. It's again the body doing what it's supposed to do. It's helping us adapt to all of the challenges that we're facing. But um, cortisol doesn't come at an expense. It doesn't come free of charge, I should say. Cortisol comes at an expense. And that is that it's taking vital energy uh, reserves from the body. So there are risks with endurance mode and with cortisol, and that is that if we're not taking regular opportunities to rest and recover, and if we remain in endurance mode for too long, um, then we will at a minimum become tired. We may become very fatigued and exhausted, but there are also a range of physical and also mental health and well-being difficulties that can arise. And I'll talk to you about them a little bit later in that presentation. But if you hold on to these two key effects first, disruption and stress, uh, loss is another significant effect, um, unfortunately, of disasters and emergencies. Um, but one of the things that happens is in our particular society is that people equate loss with material loss, whether a house has been destroyed or not a home has been destroyed. Um, but uh, there are many different types of loss and not all loss is material loss. So for example, loss of livestock, uh, loss of beloved pets, companion uh, animals, home as I've mentioned, but infrastructure on a pop property, use of land, beautiful views. I, I remember I once uh, met with a woman who had been planning to build her dream uh, home and then Black Saturday completely burnt out the, the, the lovely vista that she had uh, opposite her block. So she was experiencing significant loss associated with her, her dream. Uh, loss of time, loss of neighbours, loss of friendships. And you, so you can start to see that there are different types of loss. Um, and people can underestimate or overestimate the amount of loss. But what I want to do is emphasize that loss is wide ranging. It's unique to a person, it's unique to a community, and we can never really know what another person's loss is. Um, and so what we should just be careful to do is to not make assumptions about another person's loss. Um, you know, to not assume that because they haven't had a lot of material loss, they aren't suffering and they aren't experiencing loss because they may well be. Um, but also to not underestimate your own loss uh, also because it can be so wide ranging. As you can see, I use various images on the way through. Another big key effect is that of financial uh, consequences, which is also a form of loss. But I bring this up separately because um, it can be really quite profound and significant for people. Um, and, you know, examples of the sorts of situations that will bring about financial issues are whether a person is insured or not, or whether they have enough insurance, or um, whether they qualify for grants. But um, one of the things that we've seen occur time and time again across the duration of recovery is that people find themselves in a situation where, you know, often through no fault of their own, but because it is purely the side effect of experiencing a disaster or an emergency, um, of being financially down, of facing financial setbacks. And depending on the sort of person that you are or the, uh, the position that you're in in life, there can be this tendency, a strong motivation and a drive to want to claw the financial loss back, which makes complete sense and I think that's part of a normal human response and reaction but what I want to mention is that that's not always possible sometimes it is 
but it isn't. And what we've seen too many times, time and time again, I said, is people work themselves into the ground over the years trying to make up for financial losses. And I'm going to really emphasize on the way through this in this webinar, the importance of identifying what the most important priorities in your life are at this point in time. Six months is a good time to check in with yourself and a good time to check in with family to identify what the most important priorities are in your life because there's probably not too much point in clawing back financial losses if really important relationships suffer and start to fall apart. So just bear that in mind as well. Um, and now tiredness, exhaustion and health issues. This is a, another key side effect, unfortunately. So here's a, a little description for you to remember, um, which is, you know, there are cars, of course, some cars, four wheel drives, other that have two fuel tanks. They have the main and they have the reserve. And when you go through the fuel, um, the LPG, for example, in the main tank, and you're not near a servo, you know, you flick the switch on the dashboard and you can access uh, the fuel that's in that reserve tank. You know, you've got some petrol there to use. Now, because there's often so much to do in the first year, and because people are often so stressed, um, what they will tend to do without realizing it is they'll use all the energy in the main tank and they'll flick the switch on the dashboard without even knowing that they're doing it and they'll start drawing on energy in the reserve tank. And this is where we can start to run into difficulties in regards to health and well-being. And common difficulties that people experience are tiredness, exhaustion, and I mean deep level of exhaustion where it sort of feels like there's no energy left and other health issues. And I've mentioned some health, health issues here, but you know, common health issues that people would describe is disruption to sleep, changes in appetite, mood changes, etc. If you are familiar with any of these, if you notice any of these, again, now is a really good time to check in with yourself. Um, if you were to have the, you know, the, the ability or the privilege of talking to somebody who has or already has the lived experience of a disaster and disaster recovery, they'll tell you that it's up and down, that it's a roller coaster, um, that there are the good days and there are the not good so good days, that there are the immense challenges, but there are also the immense accomplishments, um, that there are the changes in friendships, but there are the new friendships that are gained. Uh, but you know, we have in this country come to understand that there um, are key phases to the recovery cycle. And that's what this diagram is representing here. So I think if you ever want to come back to this, you'll be able to access it on the Red Cross website. Um, but if you can just see here that initially, people feel, tend to feel really quite positive. Um, there's you know, early on heroic uh, sort of actions and efforts, which is followed by a honeymoon phase. You know, we're sort of really all in this together. We're sharing this experience together and we'll get through it together. Um, but then often and unfortunately, and look, it's not always like this, but it can be, um, that starts to wear off and the disappointment, the tiredness, the frustration, the anger with processes, you know, with systems, with things not working out, starts to rear its head. And you can see at the bottom there, you know, between one to three years, people can start to hit the point of exhaustion. You can see here these other phases as well. I won't go right through them. There is another side. There's definitely another side. Um, and I'm really coming at this uh, from a preventative perspective. The reason for sharing this information with you now is that uh, I'm really wanting to encourage you again to check in with yourself because anything that you can do now to start to put in place um, measures, strategies, plans to help yourself help your family and help friends across the course of this next 12 months and beyond um, will be helpful and will hopefully help to avoid some of these pitfalls and some of these difficulties. That's really where we're coming from. So I'm going to pause there for a moment um, and just open it up, chat, questions, conversation. And uh, we might have had th things come through on the, the chat box there, Jamie. Thanks heaps, David. Yeah, we've had um, a question just come through from Helen, if I could just bring it up here. Um, 
Helen was talking about her grandson is so full of anxiety with what's going on with COVID and other issues regarding where he's going to live, not from the fires, but also from a marriage breakdown. Um, and what um, her grandson wants is he just wants his grandma. Um, mm. There must be some others in the same boat, Helen suggests, um, but she can only see him via phone link. So, uh, the question covers just what do you think that she can be saying um, to her grandson to be help with some helping him with some of his anxiety? Sure. Yeah. Th thanks, Jamie, and thanks, Helen. Um, it's a really good question, um, which, which I'll talk about and answer. And also in this next section, I'm going to talk a little bit about the family unit and trauma and children and the things that we can see happen. Um, I think the first thing to, 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 to mention is anxiety and what that is. And that is to say that anxiety is a form of stress. It's a heightened state of stress, but in particular, anxiety is part of the body's fear response. Um, so, you know, this, this little fellow who's quite anxious is having, for, by the sounds of it, a number of different reasons, his fear response activated and if you think back to the section we just went through there's that survival alarm system so part of that is being activated for him at the moment unfortunately um, and ultimately and without knowing all of the unique circumstances uh, there's something or some things occurring for him that are causing him to feel unsafe COVID past bushfire experiences, family relationship experiences, whatever they might be. And so what he's doing is he's wanting physical contact with grandma because it, you would sort of start to think that's going to help him feel safe. So the antidote or the answer to anxiety really is and from a child's perspective, working to understand what they're fearful and scared about. And I'll talk in more detail about how to do that. Um, but uh, if we can then understand what it is, we can work to alleviate their fears and concerns. So two suggestions. One is if you can understand in particular what it is he's most fearful or scared of, if you can talk to him in an age appropriate way and alleviate his concerns and fears, um, that will be helpful for him. Um, the second is maintaining regular connection. Uh, Totally appreciate that he wants physical contact, but at the moment, of course, because of COVID, that's not possible and or did because of distance, it might be possible. Um, but one of the number one predictors of successful recovery, but then also what's incredibly helpful for alleviating, alleviating anxiety is connection with other people. So you could be doing things like not only having a regular conversation or meetups with him, um, but reading him a story, for example, um, over uh, by distance, or perhaps playing him music that he likes to listen to, or playing some sort of fun game. So anything that you can translate from the real life and do by distance um, will probably be a good in-between measure. Thank you so much, David. Some really great advice coming there. I, I've got just two other questions, if I might, please. Uh, can you explore the role of government and institutional responses with positive disaster recovery, specifically around the feeling of uh, safety and support? Um, I probably need to ask for a little bit more information about exactly what's wanted there, Jamie. I might come back to Davina if you're able uh, to just explore what that looks like a little bit. Yeah, even, even to yeah. just narrow it down a bit because we've probably only got a minute or two or a couple of minutes. Yeah, I might come back to once Davina's just been able to provide us just with a little bit more context yeah. there. But um, Maya yeah. talks about um, recovery committees, um, those in, mm. in some of the affected areas are starting to talk about resilience building actions. Mm. And it seems really quite challenging when communities are still going through those recovery phases there, David. Yeah. So, Maya asks, what are the indicators a community is ready to think about resilience activities, e.g. Um, the fire season coming up again and the fear of it happening again? When, when do yeah. you think they might be ready? Yeah, um, well, you know, what I'd like to start with just briefly is what resilience is without making it too complicated. Um, and that's because I, I think the word resilience conjures up some pretty standard sort of ideas or impressions in people's minds. For example, that resilience is being strong or that it's bouncing back stronger, um, you know, or that it's uh, recovery and getting back to the, the, the place of the position that people were in previously. But what I would mention is that resilience is very context and situation specific, and you can define it in a way that is relevant to your community's unique experiences. Um, 
So that, that's a first comment. Um, there's probably then two things. One relates to bushfire preparedness. I think the comment was there. Um, uh, and recovery committees. I'd like to just take a step back and say that at this point in time, and thinking about what I saw earlier on in the year before COVID impacted New South Wales, and then with, of course, New South Wales having had a lockdown, and what I've heard about how things are, sorry, it might not be New South Wales, other states, what I want to emphasise is the importance of connection first. Establishing connections and strengthening connections within a community, and I would sort of say uh, very strongly that that in itself is a resiliency strategy. Um, without good connections and supports in a community, anything else is going to be more difficult, whether that's forming a bushfire recovery committee or whether that's bushfire preparedness. Um, so I think that's a fundamental important starting point in thinking about how you can do that um, and lay the foundation for a community is really important. Now, bushfire recovery committees do play a really, really important role in that too. So I would see them as a resiliency uh, strategy uh, or component to a community's recovery. And then thirdly, in terms of bushfire recovery and when to start that, uh, well, we could probably be starting to lay seeds for that now. I know that some Victorian communities are talking about it already, their minds are at it. Um, but I probably, oh, what is it, July? I guess within the next couple of months, it is something that you could do. There's probably something before that though, and that is uh, working to help people be able to start to understand more about stress and reduced um, stress levels. Um, look, I, I think what I'd say is to have a look around and see what you can find in terms of already existing information and or programs to help communities prepare for the first fire season. And I wonder if there's you know, another question or two there. Probably got time yeah. for one more. Thanks heaps, David. It looks as though Carol has just mentioned that that was a good question, given that um, their property, they're preparing their property for the next bushfire season. But equally, drought is another factor that, that many of her mm. um, her community members are also fearful of. And yeah. again, that's been spoken about in the Bega Valleys. Um, Another comment here around, I am seeing increasingly alarming behaviour amongst the teenagers in our community, in particular mm. the 14 year old plus. Have you found any particular strategies or programs helpful? Um, well, what, what I will say is that this is not uncommon. You know, 14 is about year nine, I think, um, so a, a, approximately, and that is a key developmental stage for youth and adolescents. So there are ordinarily some key challenges uh, at that particular developmental stage. Um, but disasters and emergencies, whether this is bushfire or other, do have a strong tendency to accentuate problems. Um, key programs for that specific age bracket, I'm not aware of at this point in time, but we do know that what's really, really important is the family unit and the family space and that the family space and inevitably is a part of that parents and the state that they're in, their levels of stress, their levels of mental health and their availability to invest time and energy into relationships is actually really, really important. Really important to what's occurring uh, for teenagers and children. Uh, so what we need to be doing, and I'll talk about this shortly, is creating the opportunities for regular conversation uh, and starting to educate children uh, and teenagers about the coming period of time, uh, you know, what's going to happen between now and the end of the year. Thanks heaps, David. And just one last question uh, before we go to our next section here. Davina's just mm. clarified um, her previous question. Just in your experience through conversations with those uh, impacted by disasters, how greatly does the response from institutions and, and governments and things affect the feelings of safety and support by those uh, impacted? Okay. Um, a lot. A, a, a lot. Um, it plays a really, really important role and, you know, that is why there has been for a long period of time and continues to be an ongoing process of working to raise government's awareness and agencies' awareness and local councils' awareness and organisations' awareness 
uh, to the importance of establishing connections with community early on um, and working with them rather than telling them what needs to occur, you know, adopting a collaborative approach and heading down the path or heading down this path of community-led recovery. Um, it's actually really important. Uh, I mean, I will say that it is quite standard and inevitably, um, not all community members, but some will feel like their needs are not being met, you know, and those feelings and thoughts can be, uh, have varying levels of evidence sort of, uh, I guess, supporting them. One of the things that we run up against or come out to, into contact with is though that disasters are, all, are unordinary experiences um, and some people or a significant majority of people haven't had them before. And so they don't have an awareness or an understanding of how local councils or governments or organisations operate. And they also don't have an, an understanding or an awareness of um, in reality, timeframes associated with recovery. So often and unfortunately, expectations about how quickly things can happen and how easily they can happen, they don't line up with the reality. Um, that is a place that uh, governments, agencies and organisations can bridge the gap by working to educate people uh, about timeframes. Thanks so much, David. That's uh, the end of our question portion just at the moment. Yeah, okay, thank you. I'll move on to the next oh, to the next section, uh, everybody. And I just wanted to then drill down in a little bit, a, a little bit more detail, not too much more about um, stress, but you can see here, I've called this section, why does it feel so hard? Um, and I've really called it that because that is what's been coming through to us over the last month or two from fire affected communities throughout the country. So, you know, hopefully the effects and the phases that I've just highlighted to you, as well as some of the conversation and chat, you know, has started to answer the question, you know, maybe help to normalize your experience about why it's feeling so hard. Um, but as I said, I just want to drill down into a little bit more detail in regards to stress and its impact on uh, the functioning of people and of community members, because there are particular changes that occur that will make completing tasks and undertaking activities and maintaining relationships across the duration of recovery. And I have to say that we do talk with communities about years of recovery uh, as opposed to weeks or months, um, but that will run the chance of negatively affecting people's health and functioning and relationships uh, and their ability, sorry, to involve themselves in recovery. Um, so this is a, a diagram that maybe you can hold in your mind. I've touched on different stages of stress. Of course, I mentioned to you just a moment ago, survival mode. Well, that's the same as alarm stage. I then spoke to you about endurance mode, running on cortisol. That's the same as resistance stage. And then I touched on exhaustion stage. So. This diagram is showing the three well-identified stages of stress, alarm, resistance, and exhaustion. And it's just showing that at the beginning, before all of this happens, is good health. Everything in the body and the mind is sort of operating in the way that it should. Of course, not for everybody, but most of the time. And what I'm just going to bring, uh, sort of highlight to you is that the recovery journey, the recovery process, you know, that equates most closely to resistance stage or to that endurance mode, the running a marathon. Now, there are these, um, I'm not going to go into a whole biology, you know, sort of lesson here about adrenaline and cortisol, but I do want to highlight to you their actual effect on us as humans, as people, because it very, very much affects how we think and how we experience emotions and therefore how we're able to function in our day-to-day -day lives. Now, um, you know, following the 2009 fires, there was a phrase that came about within the communities uh, within the first year, and that phrase was bushfire brain. Uh, and that phrase was used to describe the way in which uh, people would, for example, forget what something was called. Um, you know, I remember many people that, that spoke to me over the years who talked about going into the pantry to put some bread in the, what's that thing called again that's plugged into the PowerPoint? Oh, that's right, the toaster. Or going to that other thing that you use to heat things up, what's that called? Oh, the microwave. 
or being in the middle of a conversation, you know, and talking to someone, and then just completely losing track you know, of what, we, what was about to be said, you know, the words just vanishing out of the head. And these are just very simple examples of stress. Um, in fact, I remember going to along to a community recovery information session about four years after those 2009 fires. Um, and this is a sort of a story I tell quite frequently where people were sitting around in groups at tables and they were asked to perform like a little exercise, kind of like what I suggested to you at the beginning of this session. And that was to think back to life and the way it was before the fires um, and to write down on sort of pieces of paper what they could remember. And it was very clear to me that there were two types of responses, two categories. There were those people who could not remember really very much at all about life before the fires. And that's an example of the effect of heightened stress on memory over a prolonged period of time. And then there were the group of people uh, that started to remember what life was like and started to remember that they used to go to the market on a Saturday morning with their kids, but they hadn't done that in four years, or that they used to have a date night with their partner, um, but they hadn't done that in a long time either. Um, that's actually a slightly different example. That's an example of the disruption that occurs in life, one of that first effect I mentioned to you, and how disruption can take over life. But here's some key effects of adrenaline and cortisol. One is that uh, because it's based on preparing us for a particular threat, we lose awareness of ourselves, we lose contact with our own health and functioning, and we put our focus onto the problems, onto the challenges to the tasks. So as an example, my property's been burnt out, and all I can sort of think about for the next six months is getting the fences back up, getting the watering troughs in place, getting the, the livestock back on the property, and it occupies my thinking 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I'm not thinking about relationships or spending time with the kids or other such things. I've got no space for that. And actually the stress is causing me to continue to function in that way. Um, also, because I'm stressed and worried, I'm in this heightened state of stress, I keep looking out for the next problem. What's going to be the next thing that happens? Um, and so, unfortunately, you know, life can become a lot about the disaster or disasters and ongoing emergencies. Life can become very stressed. And again, not always like this for everybody, but um, it can be like this for many. So routines can be lost, you know, and that normal life starts to fade off into the background and we start to lose track of what it was like and relationships can start to recover. More specifically, and you know, again, you might be able to come back to this information and have a look at it, but in regards to thinking and emotions, when we're stressed, we don't solve problems well. We don't think creatively. We tend to just sort of, uh, to, we will tend to only do what we're familiar with, and uh, we'll just tend to, day after day, put one foot in front of the other and just try to work our way through the list. But we're often not seeing faster and more efficient ways to do things, we're often also not recognizing mistakes that we're making. Um, emotionally, and we see this again in communities quite frequently and sort of in family units as well, there's a tendency for people to jump to conclusions or for there to be increased anger and irritability. You know, dad becomes more hot-headed, the kids are wary of going, uh, going close to him or near him or running up for a cuddle because you know, he might blow up, he's got a million things on his mind. Um, we also know that people can become more tearful and upset more easily, or they might just go very much inside of themselves, you know, become quite numb and withdrawn. You know, and, and you, can, you can see that someone has become like that. They're not sort of interacting in the way that they used to. So it, it can this prolonged stress state, that resistance state, or, you know, that endurance mode of running the marathon, um, it can result you know, in people getting worn down and they just start to think, I don't want to go through this. I just wish it could all be over. You know, I want my normal life back, which makes sense. Um, but then we also know, and this happened in a community session at the end of last year in Victoria, um, that there's a point where people start to see, actually, it's not going to go back to normal life anytime soon. And you know, everything 
that I can see that needs to be sorted out and done in our lives is going to take you know, a, a, an extra bit of time. I can see it's going to take another six months at least, or maybe it's going to take another year. Um, we might not even have approval from the council to rebuild yet, and it's sort of six months. They might not even start rebuilding until towards the end of the year, and then it will take 10 months or longer to build the house. Now that's well into 2020. So people can start to catch a glimpse of that, and it can start to weigh on people. Um, but I really want to emphasize to you that if this is you, you're definitely not alone. And these are common, well-identified experiences in communities. And there definitely is a way for it, but we need to plan for it. We need to allow for it and we need to set our expectations for it and find ways to preserve our health and well-being for that period of time. You know, this will be a phase of life, um, but there will be a point in time where your life has come back together again. So I'll just now, um, before we move to another, sort of open it up for conversation and chat and questions, just touch on a few things with you now about the family unit, um, trauma and children. So I, I just want to mention now, you know, what is a family unit? Well, it's a group of people sharing a connection or a bond with each other. That's one way to look at it. Um, and we know that family units and in fact health and well-being within families, you know, it's promoted or it's supported by time, investment, having shared experiences, caring and understanding. Uh, it, you know, of course, doing things together and I'm not only talking about the stereotypical family unit, you know, the, the parents and two children, there are all sorts of variations of family units. Um, and setting aside time to connect with people is what maintains and builds relationships over time. Now, you've heard me talk on a couple of occasions already about disruption and stress. And what that does is that uh, runs the risk of threatening connections, um, threatening the potential uh, to spend time and to invest in relationships. And of course, you can start to realize what that means. You know, that means that these connections can become weakened over the time. Uh, you know, what that disruption can do as well is it upsets the routines that would ordinarily sort of bind or hold a family unit together that prior to the disaster or the emergency, people don't even think about. You know, they don't think about the fact that shooting off to the shops together where there's a conversation in the car about what happens at school actually is something really helpful and useful um, or going out together to visit some friends um, and then the conversation that takes place at friends houses or the play that happens between the kids you know is all a part of the human experience of sharing experience of sharing things and learning things and developing but often after after a disaster or during an emergency if you're in isolation or lockdown those things get disrupted or they get put on hold. Uh, there's then a couple of other things to mention to you, and that is that children and young people, depending upon their age, won't talk about what's happening for them. Um, one, they might not have the language skills that enable them to do that. You know, a four or five year old can't express in intricate detail what's happening for them internally, but an adult can. Um, and so we won't ordinarily know what's occurring for them. Um, one, what we need to do, and I'll talk about this in a moment in the trauma section, is keep an eye out for behavioural change uh, that's taking place. But uh, if the basis of maintaining good health in a family unit is connection, and if that is supported by these different sort of components that I'm mentioning to you, you can start to see how managing the disruption and the stress that can flow into life is actually really, really important. Um, and I can't emphasize enough you know, how beneficial it can be to set aside even a small amount of time. That might just be 10 minutes to do something with a child or with a partner uh, or with a parent. The key thing is during that period of time, to try to be totally invested in that person, try to be totally connected with them and to try to be in the moment, you know, not there physically, but then in your mind. 
thinking about a million other things because they'll just be able to see it in your face that you're not really present. Um, yeah, I just want to touch on briefly trauma and you know, don't worry, it's not going to be an intricate explanation about trauma. But what I want, I want to bring it up because the word gets used a lot um, after disasters and during emergencies and people don't un always understand exactly what it means. Now, essentially becoming traumatized um, is damage to a person. Um, it's an injury and it's an injury that doesn't heal. That's one way to think about um, what trauma actually is. But what I want to mention to you is that uh, there are what we call traumatic events or traumatic experiences, but experiencing one doesn't mean that you go on to become traumatized. Traumatized is the damage. And in fact, it's a smaller proportion of people. We know approximately 20% um, that will have a significant long lasting mental health impact after experiencing a significant event and a smaller proportion of people within that 20% that will actually develop a trauma response or reaction. But the vast majority of people do recover and heal of their own accord. But the starting point is to realize it's an injury that hasn't yet healed um, and that just going through a fire, a bushfire or a flood or experiencing COVID or drought um, doesn't mean that a person has become traumatized. So, you know, what, what do we do? Well, we need to understand in particular um, two, two things. One, what a person thought was going to happen at the time of the event. So, for example, if a person thought they were going to die, um, there's a pretty reasonable chance they have had a very significant experience. Um, secondly, we can think about whether they were there to directly go through the event or whether they heard about it secondarily. Um, so that means you're there on the day to experience the fire, a ch an adult, a child, a youth is there, or they heard about it through somebody that's indirect. People can become traumatized whether they directly or indirectly experienced it. And thirdly, um, if a person is continuing to feel very unsafe and scared much of the time, well, there is the potential of ongoing trauma effect. And then just lastly, and in particular, this is a reference to children and young people because they often can't talk about what's occurring for them in their minds. We need to keep an eye out for changes in behavior um, and if those behaviours were not there before the event, there's a pretty reasonable chance that the actual event of the fire, uh, a fire, was the cause. I then just want to touch on something uh, that we call regression in children and youth, because people might notice this and not understand what it is. And that is that when children have uh, a big experience, it's, it's not at all unusual for them to regress or go backwards in their behavior. So that is, they might, it might almost appear that they're doing something that they did when they were far younger, a year or two ago. Uh, so, you know, even with teenagers, we might find that there are teenagers who, for example, don't want to sleep in their own room alone. They want to sleep in mum and dad's room. It's honestly not unusual. You might have a teenager that wants to sleep in bed with their mum and dad. Um, because they're still very scared and feeling unsafe. Or we might hear about children that are very clingy. Um, they want to be around mum all of the time. And if mum is going to go to another room in the house, they want to know where she's going, why she's going there. They want to go with her. You know, they're very attached. So these are examples of changes in behaviour, but they're also examples of regressive changes in behaviour. Um, and it's a sign that a young person, you know, a little person has had, uh, a big experience that they're trying to make space for to work through. Um, but again, what parents and carers can do if you've noticed this and if you don't know what's going on um, and you feel okay to do this, otherwise you can link in with the service, um, use what we call observation and curious questioning to try to get inside the child's or the youth's world again to understand what's happening for them and to, through conversation and language, try to provide some support, some reassurance, and actually to resolve 
fears that they might have because some of the ongoing fears are unfounded and they're based upon a misinterpretation and sometimes you can correct that through conversation um, and I've made this point already that making the family a calm and supportive place to be is really important so um, I'll stop there now Jamie and just open this section you know, back up to, to questions and chat yeah, thanks so much for that, David. Um, Jody's just asking about a question specifically around community groups, and they're wanting to meet, needing to meet to increase that connection. Mm. Um, but we hear, uh, but she hears that when groups are set up, attendance may be low. People are still withdrawn and concerned. What advice would you have for assisting with building community confidence and connecting again after this time of isolation? Um, yeah, it's such an important thing to do. Um, you know, I haven't mentioned this yet, but uh, what's, what is known and understood really, really well is that connection within communities, you know, and there's different types of connection, but let's just say essentially connections between community members, so relationships, um, it's actually the number one driver of successful recovery. So communities that are more connected prior to an event tend to recover better. Communities that are more fractured prior to an event tend to find it a bit harder. And communities that can facilitate and maintain connections and relationships after an event um, tend to you know, do, do better across the duration. So I think what we need to do, and I know from experience, um, in terms of how you set about doing this and uh, ways that are going to work, perhaps we know we need to think about, I'm not sure whether you're in a, COVID-19 impacted area and you're facing isolation and lockdown at the moment, but that's a consideration, I guess, in the answer. Firstly, um, let's set expectations about this being a slow and gradual process, because you're right, you won't necessarily straight away get lots and lots of people attending. What's well known and understood is that often the people that most need to be a part of community related events don't come along. Um, and we have to leave time for the information, or I guess, or awareness of the groups would be a better word to use, to actually start to flow out through a community, through the communicational channels, and to find people, you know, in their little pockets and wherever they happen to be, and to then try to draw them in. So that then highlights an important strategy, which is in your community, identifying the already existing communicational networks like is there a Facebook page or could you set one up is there a web page or could you set one up and use it is there maybe a community-based newsletter is there a central notice board um, are there some already well identified community sort of reps or respected people in the community is there a central club you know clubhouse or sporting activity because these will be the things that people frequent the most or access the most and that's where they will get information from. They won't always and often go looking at a separate council or governmental website for information, you know, not necessarily straight off the bat. They'll go to what they know, they know and are familiar with. So I would be thinking about using them to send information out um, and then you think about whether you can organize things that are face to face or whether they're going to need to be online um, and sort of if they're face to face or online I would just and I'll sort of finish off after this say be open to all sorts of different um, strategies or uh, I guess community based activities whether that's uh, I remember in Victoria, a group was run for women to learn how to use chainsaws, but then there was mosaicing, there was making letter boxes, there were um, sporting groups that came together, and then once a month there was a sit down meal or dinner, or some community groups had a dinner every uh, once a week. Um, these can be fantastic options to bring people together to start to talk about what's happened and what's happening and to establish and strengthen connections. Thanks heaps, David. That's very, very helpful. I think a lot of our uh, listeners at the moment are working with communities and are just wanting, I guess, some 
other resources and support that they could actually distribute to their communities um, about identifying and treating stress because some of the, some community members may not even recognize the stress in their own lives so mm. is some um, is there something that is a that communities might be able to identify self-identify um so uh, uh yes a start Look, the, the, one of the issues that's going through my mind is that there is so much information available and for people that are highly stressed, um, you know, we just need to be careful to not bombard them with too much. Uh, there is a real importance, of course, as I've been talking about, of raising people's awareness to the heightened state of stress. Um, and I'd suggest that you, primar you do that primarily through conversation and communication, but then you back it up in written format um, but the written format needs to be not too complicated or complex because people can't take it in anyway, gen generally. Um, look, I, I guess we could send out or include particular resources, but, you know, the Better Health Channel, I know, has lots of good websites, uh, sorry, resources available on it, some of which we've been involved in putting together after different events. Um, and they cover such things as stress responses and reactions, uh, survival mode, the endurance mode, traumatic stress reactions, etc. cetera. Um, but you, you will probably also have, uh, I guess, a, a plethora of information and resources available in your particular state. But I reckon what I'd suggest is you just narrow it down to two or three and rely on those, you know, and use those and that they're what you then sort of link people into. But your main way at the moment, I think, to raising people's awareness is through verbal communication, when you meet with them or talk to them, but then to sort of link them to resources, but to, to try to make sure that it's not too complex or complicated. Thanks heaps for that, David. In um, our email out to our participants today, we'll be uh, in, We'll ensure that those uh, better health examples are included as a part of the email out. Um, I've got another question here around uh, more specifically how do we support community to mend fractures and bring factions together? So you spoke about how mm. um, communities who had uh, pre-existing fractions may find mm. it challenging to recover but how do how do some support organizations go about bringing people together to recover? Yeah, well, you know, I know that through some of the states like Victoria and New South Wales, and this has been mentioned already, but bushfire recovery committees play a pivotal role because they act as the voice for the community. Um, and they can then work to identify cleavages before they emerge or as they're emerging. Um, and, then, and then through, well, firstly, acknowledging the cleavage uh, and then uh, firstly by acknowledging the cleavage and then giving people uh, you know, the capacity or the, the space to actually talk about and voice what the particular or the, is the issue or concerns are, then work to tend to those differences. Um, they always need to be acknowledged, but ultimately what we need to do is keep working from the perspective of supporting a community to a sort of lead and drive its own recovery, but you put the cleavages on the table for open discussion, really, as best as is possible and work with the community and support the community to identify what potential options or solutions are, you know, to resolve points of difference and then to put a strategy in place. Um, actually, something else to mention is to uh, say that uh, sometimes Cleavages really are, are based upon misinformation and mis mistruths or rumours. Um, and so this is where hard factual information can play a really, really important role. And sometimes providing that, or a lot of the time providing that in writing and maybe handing it out at a community recovery session is actually really important. 
Thanks so much, David. And just one final question from Stephen before we move on to the next section around after setting the expectations low for a small community activity, how will the publicity after the event impact those that were unaware or chose not to attend? Could the PR impact negatively? So it looks as though Stephen has set up a community activity at some stages, invited the broader community to attend mm. uh, and would be advertising the success or whatever about that event. Um, mm. Could the PR impact negatively for those who um, were unaware or chose not to attend? Well, I, I guess potentially uh, people could feel left out, you know, or like they were excluded. Um, but then this is where commute, I mean, I, I still think it would be better to run the event than to not run the event. But then we need to look at or just continue to be aware of the important role that ongoing communication plays. Um, after that particular event and keep feeding out the, the messages and the information that the session or the sessions, you know, if there are to be a future sessions, and I would suggest that, you know, there could be or there should be, that they continue to be open to all members of the community, you know, and that they are for the benefit of people, uh, for everybody in the community as well. Um, perhaps, you know, I just sort of make the point here, and I don't know exactly how, all of this is going in other states, but um, knowing and understanding well that it is quite typical that the people who are most in need don't come along to community-based sessions um, or activities. Try to, if you can find out if anyone in your particular area or community is performing outreach or offering outreach services, and you become of a, aware of a person um, who feels like they have been left out but doesn't seem prepared or able to come along to something or to involve themselves in something. If you can and it seems appropriate, link them into an outreach service. And I'm pretty sure we will start to see uh, a number of different variations of different outreach services sort of coming to the surface. And that's another way to establish the linkages with those people that are most in need. Thanks heaps, David. That's the final portion of the questions. Okay. Thanks everyone. You know, really great comments and questions. Um, yeah, it's just always important, I think, to, you know, use these sort of sessions as, as much as is possible to uh, bring questions up, have conversation, you know, have various discussions about things and learn as much as we can um, as a group about what's occurring in your community because, you know, overall, you know, all of this, information that I'm sharing with you I guess is based on what we've come to know and understand and recognize. Um, it won't always be exactly like this in your community or communities that you're working with but do just take from the information what you feel is most appropriate and apply it as best you can um, and because the Red Cross is going to make it sort of available and uh, available for you to come back to, I think do come back and sort of access it and look at it from time to time. So just just to recap, you know, so far in the session, um, we've had a look at common effects uh, of disasters and emergencies like disruption, stress, loss, financial consequences and health impacts. Um, and then I just touched on with you the recovery cycle, that diagram, drill down into a bit more detail in regard to stress and key effects on thinking, key effects on emotions and how uh, those changes don't help people across the duration of recovery. And then had a look at trauma, children and youth. Um, what I then sort of just want to highlight and touch on um, is that each disaster and each event, although there are commonalities between them, they each have their own unique features as well. And, you know, when we can come to understand even at least some of those own unique features, that will, that will tend to help you in um, supporting individuals and communities affected by events a bit more frequently. Now, these are just my thoughts at this point in time about um, bushfire, COVID and drought. So, you know, let's see what we can come to understand. Um, a lot of this also comes though from first-hand feedback from communities since the, uh, the Christmas fires, or the fires earlier this year, also from drought affected communities um, and also from what we're seeing as a result of COVID. So I'll make these comments that, 
know, usually a bushfire, not all of the time, but usually it comes and goes quite quickly. Um, it's stressful. Uh, and for some people, it's frightening, you know, and as I mentioned, for some people, it also has a traumatic impact and effect. Um, but what's come through in regards to, from many of the communities in regards to the fire events that took place in the lead up to Christmas and New Year's um, was that there were multiple evacuations, not just one. There were you know, more than one, two or three or four, depending upon where a person was located and which community that they were a part of. Um, and so really what that means is usually that people go into and out of that survival mode more than once, repetitively. Um, and that's, that tends to be very, very tiring. It can be very exhausting. Uh, and some people will not, they won't come out of that survival mode completely either. They'll stay in that survival mode. And there were definitely people that remained in that very high state of stress for days and weeks on end. You know, we had that real extended period of bushfire threat and of bushfires, which essentially creeped down the coast from the north all the way down over a number of months. Um, also, and I touched on this a little bit earlier on, you know, there are these assumptions about loss and often equating it with material loss and then uh, I guess unrealistic expectations about time frames, unfortunately, and, you know, simply because it's an unknown, unfamiliar experience for people. So I'm talking now about after the fire event. Um, from a sort of a community type perspective, so whether you're out there listening to this, watching this as a part of a community, or whether you're working with a community, you know, and now just sort of think back to the diagram. I showed you the disaster, uh, the, the phases of recovery, and just realise that often people start out in a very positive, united way, uh, but then as people tire and as the reality of recovery becomes apparent, points of difference can start to emerge, cleavages can start to open up, um, and relationships can start to suffer. And then underneath that is heightened stress, tiredness exhaustion. So these are common features of bushfire recovery, but what was very unique actually um, to these most recent bushfires was the extended period of threat. And I'm going to come to COVID in a moment, but what's certainly been of concern to us and has been in my mind that there will have been many community members who were already feeling very tired and exhausted as a result of their bushfire experiences that went for that extended period and then COVID-19 came along. Um, you know, for some people that caused additional significant stress and disruption. You know, for some people it slowed things down and sort of having to isolate in the, the house provided a bit of an opportunity to rest, but not all of the time. Um, so now I've just mentioned some key features of COVID-19 that have become apparent. Um, and of course, one is in comparison to a fire or a flood, the threat is invisible. You know, we can't see it. Um, but it's both a real threat. However, it can also be an imaginary threat. You know, essentially, every other person is a potential, every person is a potential carrier of the virus you don't know. Um, and whether the threat is real or whether it's imaginary, I mean, although it's important, I'm going to say it doesn't matter, but it doesn't matter in the context of the body in terms of stress responses will respond in the same way. And that is, it will go back up into a heightened state of stress. And, you know, maybe we can start to see and feel, and certainly in Victoria, this is the case. And after yesterday, 500 odd cases or close to it, um, the sense of anxiety in the community is really starting to lift. And, what comes through in the media reporting is that New South Wales is on high alert. You know, the community transmission is starting to appear, the clusters are beginning to emerge. And I think there's that, um, you know, people are sort of on tender hooks wondering what's going to happen. Um, isolation and quarantine, it's caused significant disruption. And I've spoken about how connection promotes health and well-being. Um, you know, connection comes in all sorts of forms, though, not only with family members and friends, but in the workplace. Working from home changes things. Uh, for example, you don't have that usual conversation with someone in the lunchroom or the hallway. 
or something I've seen a fair bit of, you know, and heard about is the disconnection from sporting clubs and activities and people really feeling the effect of that. Um, the future, of course, also appears uncertain. When is this all going to end? Are we going to get, you know, a second wave? What will happen after that? Will there be further lockdowns? And what about the financial and economic consequences? So for the average person, you know, this is something that hasn't been experienced before. It's a big experience for most people. But if you've been through drought already, or are going through drought, and if you've been through bushfire, um, then this is something you know that's significant on top. And from a recovery perspective, it's been causing delays. Um, I reckon we're at least three months behind the eight ball where we would normally be from a recovery perspective. So there are these unique features um, that run the risk of sort of having an effect on health and well-being. Um, and drought also, unfortunately, brings its own unique features. Um, drought typically involves being in that endurance mode or that resistance stage, as I call it, for a prolonged period of time, for months and months and months, if not longer. And I'm well aware that many communities came into bushfire having already been in drought for a long period of time. And then there's been COVID, you know, hence the term, the triple whammy of these three events. We know drought affected communities, you know, um, feel forgotten. Often drought doesn't feature in the media as much. It doesn't hold the public's interest as much. And there can be this real sense and experience for drought affected communities of feeling very isolated. Um, if that's you know your experience and you're listening to this, I just re again really want to emphasise that you're not forgotten. Um, certainly those agencies and people that are working to support communities, drought is very much in the forefront, you know, and something um, that is a high priority. We also know that there is a drought cycle, you know, drought is not just about there not being rain and not enough of it. Um, there's a whole series of things that occur that um, the general person is not aware of, aware, aware of. And then when the rain does finally come, that doesn't actually equal recovery. Many people out there outside of the drought affected communities think, oh, well, the rain is, the drought is broken. That's it, everything is good now. But that's far from the case. And it can be because of that perspective that actually uh, those living in a drought affected community feel even less supported. You know, when the rains come, there's actually uh, many, many decisions that need to be made. Um, and then, of course, there is the country stoicism, you know, that can make it hard to ask for help. Uh, you know, this is just part of life and living on the land. There are those people who are far worse off than me, um, and people just push ahead, push ahead, push ahead but without a real awareness or understanding of the price that can be paid across the longer term. So in terms of making some suggestions, practical implications and suggestions here, um, well, actually I've already started to touch on this, but adjusting expectations, you know, I'm just emphasizing the real importance of it uh assisting people to think about the importance of preparing to run a marathon rather than a sprint or to conserve their energy levels for the duration secondly to prioritize life priorities yeah now again six months is a really good time to check in with self um, and to assess where you're at bring awareness back to self work to identify what your levels of stress are like, what your levels of health and well-being are like, um, but also work to identify what your priorities are because, you know, again, and I'm sorry to say, there are sort of too many stories of people getting a number of years down the track and relationships or other important aspects of life have suffered because the disruption, because the stress, because all of the tasks that need to be completed have gotten in the way. So it's important to prioritise them, write them down somewhere or store them in your phone in the notes section or put them somewhere that you're going to come across on a regular basis so you get reminded of them. Um, 
And then thirdly, anticipate ups and downs. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, um, if you had the privilege or the opportunity of talking with someone who has a first-hand bushfire, drought or sort of other related experience, they'll tell you that there are ups and downs. There are the challenging days, the less challenging days. There are the positives that come from recovery related experiences and being a part of community events. But then there are also the things that are very, very bad and you sort of need to clear space uh, and time in life to make an allowance for that. You know, that's probably one of the, the very big things is realizing that over the coming year, the coming, well, six months to the end of the year and in the lead up to the first summer and then the second year, it's just not going to be possible for a lot of people uh, to, to have the same levels of responsibility in life or the same level of commitment to um, all aspects of life or to tend to life in exactly the same way as was the case prior to these particular events. You know, we need to make allowances. So this is where adaptability and flexibility comes in. And I'll open this up to questions again in conversation. Yeah, thanks so much, David. Uh, a lot of comments coming through specifically around um, the impact that COVID has had on bushfire recovery. As we know at Red Cross, we talk about communi community connection being one of the um, mm. primary uh, things that we, we, you know, we do especially to try and get people talking and communicating again. Um, mm. Maya makes the comment that um, restrictions obviously have impacted com community developing their own events. Mm. Um, but how do we let community know that they are not forgotten in COVID? Mm. Um, a, a, well, a, again, using the, I would suggest using the pre-existing communicational pathways to send out information and messages that say just that, you know, and to do that on a regular basis, because ultimately, you know, what we're working to do, and if you look at this from a human perspective, is use communication, which can't take place in a, a real life face-to-face -face format, to maintain a connection with people over a period of time, and to provide a level of reassurance and support, you know, and through that communication emphasised to them, there's an ongoing commitment to be with them um, and to support them and help them. So um, I sort of tend to say any way that you can send that information out is important. I think if you can be helping to facilitate and set up in your community regular online, uh, you know, or by distance community information sessions or whatever you might want to call them, connection without contact is a phrase that we've been using in Victoria, um, then that's going to be helpful for people. You know, I noticed that my local uh, community hub, which is down the road, um, they've set up a, a once a week session for general community members to tune into. Um, and they're having someone like a, a, a key person talk or speak during the event, but they're also using it as a way to inform community members about what's taking place in the community in the midst of lockdown. And of course, in Melbourne and where I'm in, I am, um, we're in lockdown again, and it's probably gonna be that way for some time. Thank you so much for the comments there, David. Another comment that just came through was, um, I think there is a risk to staff burnout who are working in this space. Mm. What are your thoughts about that? Absolutely, without a doubt. And um, uh, uh, look, I, I can't agree more and emphasise it enough more. Self-care and well-being for staff uh, is a very like, strong interest area of mine. It's a very important area. And with everything that has gone on in Australia over the last six to 12 months, um, again, to use the phrase now is a really good time to be setting aside time in organisations and agencies, uh, setting aside time to include, I'll say formal sort of sessions, I'm hesitant to say training, but formal sessions that cover self-care and well-being, um, but also start to adapt workplace policies, procedures, habits, and routines to incorporate self-care and wellbeing practices. So, I mean, I'll give you an example of that. Um, and that would be if there's a team meeting 
uh, once a week and the team meeting ordinarily is of course just to talk about professional issues setting aside 10 minutes in that team meeting and if you need to extend it by 10 minutes do that but to allow a kind of a check-in with the with staff you know how how are those people in your team tracking at the moment in terms of their health and well-being and really start to convey now the importance of self-care because um and i'll finish with this but what I sort of tend to mention and say very strongly about self-care and if you think back to that three-stage model of stress, alarm stage, resistance, exhaustion, working in a disaster or working amidst COVID is very much working in a state of resistance because uh, the expectations are higher and the workload is higher generally. And so what self-care does and what it's really important for is it, it allows for and creates regular opportunities to rest and recover which enables the body to drop out of or come out of endurance mode and restore uh, restore well we call it homeostasis but um, sort of start to put things back to their normal healthy levels as opposed to just keeping your foot on the gas and going 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 that's what contributes to things like work-related burnout but there are other issues like vicarious trauma and compassion fatigue, which people need to be made aware of. Thanks so much again, David. That's sort of the, uh, the comment and question portion. Ready when you yeah. are? Yeah. Okay. So that's a good segue into skills to promote self-care, connection and well-being. And I, I guess, uh, I don't know exactly, I'm getting a sense that there are some community members tuned in but there are also people from service providers um, that are tuned into this as well. So I'll sort of try to tend to both needs. Um, and again, you take from this what you feel is appropriate. So I, I thought an important starting point here is to just raise the issue, uh, or yeah, to raise the issue of the word recovery um, and what that word actually means. And that being because if you, if you go to a dictionary, well, firstly, you're going to hear the word used a lot um, just out there generally, whether that's in the community or in the workplace, um, it's a word that has just been being used for a long time. But if you go to a definition, uh, sorry, a dictionary and you look up the word recovery and read that description there, it will tell you that recovery is something like a return to a prior state of functioning. Um, and so I think what's important to highlight is that recovery in the disaster space is actually not always about getting life uh, returning to a prior state of functioning or getting life back to the way it was or getting my normal life completely back again i say this cautiously for some people that is possible but for others it isn't you know a new house will always be different to the prior home a new house takes time to feel like a home neighbors may move away relationships may change they're always going to be sort of differences and what we know can uh, inadvertently like result in people i guess having difficulties or running into difficulties is that they get locked on to really over focused on getting their lives back to the way it was because they think if they can do that everything will be okay you know all of the, the problems the issues and the stresses will go away and again, whilst that is possible for some people, a lot of the time it isn't possible. And so I think what we need to start to think about, apart from all of these things I've been mentioning so far, like finding a speed that's right for you and managing the disruption and the stress and conserving energy, um, is that you know the way life is going to become over the coming months and years, it's going to involve definitely parts of your old life and you need to go back to them as soon as you can and go back to those old habits and routines you know if and when you can but it's also going to incorporate uh, involve incorporating new things so recovery really is a, a joining together or a merging together of the old and the new to create something that's different but it has aspects of familiarity with it um, but what we need to do as well is for people to really recover is reach a point where life has meaning and purpose once again. You know, they can feel that and they can feel motivated. So I just wanted to put that there at the starting point because I don't want people to get caught up in 
this issue of getting everything back to exactly the way it was because we, we've all seen uh, the negative impact and effect that, that can have. Secondly, and with how I wanted to get stuck on you know, definitions, I, I also just want to say that well-being in comparison to self-care, well-being is a state. You know, it's a state of mind. Um, it's a state of feeling a certain way emotionally. It's a state of being able to make a contribution to my community or to maintain relationships. Self-care, on the other hand, uh, is or are the things that we do, the practices, the strategies, the habits we put in place that work to promote a state of well-being. So self-care is what we do in order to experience a state of well-being. And you know, I, I probably also wanted to sorry for flicking, take it a step further and say that um, looking at this from a, a preventative perspective and a health and well-being perspective, what I really want to encourage people to do as well is to start practicing self-care now after this session, you know, later today, tomorrow, for the days and weeks ahead, and to not wait until the problems emerge, you know, to not wait until physical health issues come about or to not wait until mental health issues uh, come about because by then, well, not that it's too late, but by then, we then need to go down the path of treatment or working on and solving a problem. But we can often prevent a lot of those things happening by practicing self care and improving our state of well being. Doesn't mean you have a high state of well being all the time, it will still be the good days and the bad days, but it kind of acts as a bit of a buffer to becoming unwell. Um, so, you know, a way to think about this, um, these are my sort of, uh, I guess, key suggestions or summary points to you about how self-care works. Well, one, it's not a case that you either have self-care skills or you don't. Um, they just, they, you may have some already, you may not, but overall, they can be learned and strengthened over time. It's never too late. Secondly, think about leisure and pleasure. Um, leisure and pleasure or self-care creates opportunities to rest and recover. Um, it importantly aims to limit the amount of time that you spend in that prolonged state of stress, in that endurance mode or in that resistance state, and it increases the chance for you to come back to your comfort zone. So if I make sure that I'm going for a short walk or going for a run, or playing with the dogs, or uh, kicking the footy with the kids, or whatever it happens to be. And if I work to do that regularly and to really be in the moment when I do that, I increase the chance that I stop thinking about work-related issues or think about all the recovery-related issues and problems. And my body can, and my mind can stay, take a step back and can start to relax rather than continuing to hold it all. Um, so, you know, Ultimately, this means that we begin to reduce the chance of paying a price in the long term. Now, I'm not just mentioning these things to you because it seems like they will work. You know, this is all uh, sort of grounded in some well-identified information. And, you know, I thought it might be of interest for you to realise that, you know, given I've talked a fair bit about stress today, that there are some well-identified self-care strategies and techniques that actually help in the body uh, regulate the stress response or our tolerance to stress. So there are certain things that we can do that will actually have an effect on what's occurring internally at a physical level in our body and that's scientifically proven. Uh, mindfulness meditation is one example of that. Physical exercise and activity is another. Um, we know that they produce particular chemical responses in the body, which help to combat the effect of stress. So, you know, I guess it goes without saying, and many people will have had the experience already, that if you exercise physically, you tend to feel better afterwards. Um, as long as you don't overdo it, of course. So um, I'm not going to run through intricate detail here about the particular types of self-care. There isn't time for that. What I want to do is highlight the importance of it but I've suggested here four categories that you could think about self-care existing in physical, emotional, social, and community-based. Um, 
So for example, physical, physical activity, as I've mentioned, it's enjoyable, making sure you've got time for leisure and pleasure. Um, good quality sleep is so, so important. Sleep has a, 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 plays a really important role in maintaining healthy functioning, as does eating healthy foods, good nutrition. Uh, there's a tendency for that to completely go out the window when people are stressed, both in regards to poor sleeping habits, but also in regards to poor eating habits. Um, emotionally, you know, we can start to talk about techniques like calm breathing, learning a relaxation exercise, learning a meditation technique, learning some mindfulness uh, exercises, uh, developing an optimistic outlook, practicing an attitude of gratitude. Um, these are all techniques that are well identified to help with that stress response and reaction and are identified to help with promoting health and well-being. You know there are lots of easy to access free downloadable apps that will help you learn a relaxation technique uh, or a meditative technique or to learn how to practice gratitude. There are even online gratitude journals. Um, from a social perspective, community perspective, I've you know, really emphasised the importance of connections within community, being supported and not being alone. Um, and I'll tell you, just moving on to this fourth category here, community, that in Victoria, Melbourne University has been doing work with fire affected communities across the last 10 years. Um, and just last year, they put out a summary of their key findings from the 10 years they've spent working with communities. Um, and one of those findings was that people who were involved in community initiatives and activities um, tend to recover better and have better health and well-being. So really, really important. That's been found by other people as well around the world. So two more slides, I think, and then I'll open it up to some questions. Top tips for self-care. Um, well, I've said now is a very good time to bring your awareness back to self or to work to bring awareness back to community that you're working with. Look for signs of stress, disturbed sleep, changes in appetite, anger and irritability, to name just a few, reduce concentration, memory issues, and then make a plan to practice self-care. Um, unfortunately, regrettably, self-care doesn't just happen by thinking about it, you have to practice it. So you've got to make the commitment to yourself and sometimes it helps if you make yourself accountable by other, to others. So you tell them that you're going to uh, aim to go for a short walk three days a week or three mornings a week um, and then to stick to it. Conversation, conversation, conversation and connections. Talking to people in community um, and you'll find that you're not alone. The shared experiences start to come out um, find a speed for recovery that's right for you. Don't let the disruption take over your life and don't allow your entire life to become about recovery and getting everything back to the, to the way it was. Flexibility, adapting um, and setting expectations. Time frames and expectations are important. So what have we learned? Um, a key ingredient that promote good health in individuals um, after disasters and emergencies and after adversity and trauma? Well, one, feeling safe, having a sense of safety, makes sense. Two, feeling like I've got some control over my life. Thirdly, being optimistic and hopeful, trying to have that outlook and maintain that outlook. Fourthly, that I'm still not uh, frightened and scared because of the ongoing events of the day, for example, in the case of a bushfire. Um, fifthly, that uh, well, ideally having as few a number of other stresses in life impacting helps a person as well. So, you know, if you have a disaster experience, but you also have financial problems, relationship problems, COVID, a child going through year 12 at the moment and something else happening, you know, they're examples of additional stresses. So anything we can do to work to reduce them or alleviate them will be helpful. And you can see here again, and this is what the science tells us, this list here, um, we're back to social supports and social connections, the important role they play. So it's a good point to open it up for questions um, and comments about self-care and wellbeing connection and how to promote it.
Thanks again, David. Uh, Davina has just made another comment here. I have noticed a consistent theme throughout this is managing expectations. Would this be a reasonable foundation to work from in prevention and response dialogue and modes of disaster response and recovery? So managing expectations. Yeah, it's a, it, yes is the easy answer. It's a really important aspect. Um, just think about the language that you use and the importance of finding the balance between uh, the importance of finding the balance between coming across in a supportive and understanding way versus when you start to mention to people that they need to prepare for a marathon rather than a sprint or to conserve energy or that recovery is years that you don't come across as uh, inadvertently come across as being negativistic or unoptimistic, you know, and then what you can work to do is to tell people that you're coming at this from a preventative perspective. So yes is the easy answer um, and blend that with information about stress and health and well-being. Thanks heaps, David. Um, yeah, the, as it was mentioned, the delivery is imperative. Um, and as we know, um, recovery happens at the time of the actual event itself and you know how you how you talk to people really really mm. impacts on their journey moving forward and their yeah. experience there doesn't appear to be any more questions or queries i think you've answered everything by the sounds of it in your presentation I might just give um a couple more moments just to um this is a good point from maya um, in their river communities, they don't have very good access to um, computers or internet, which makes the online communications very hard and it's a bit of an accessibility mm. issue. So yeah. in lieu of the face to face, providing hard copy is the most effective, but challenging to provide those support supports that it need is. to be a little bit more personalized. So yeah, yeah. your advice there? Yeah, we've been dealing this with uh, dealing with this in Victoria, unfortunately, in fire affected communities um, and in working with schools in fire affected communities so um, aside from hard copy sort of delivery of information the path we've been going down is try to, trying to utilize local radio to transmit information because people who don't have internet um, you know or can't get out and about to collect things might listen to radio so you might have some local community based radio that would have you on for a period of time uh, to send through important messages um, and the other part from that's right, um, you know, we've also started to use, and Red Cross is doing this, I think, pre recorded short video clips that can be put up on a community Facebook page or on a local council Facebook page. Um, and those video clips can be about a person or a couple of people talking about key issues like stress or the duration of recovery or health and well being. Just three or four minutes generally is enough, maybe five minutes max. Um, and then just try to try to promote that as much as is possible. Thanks so much, David. Another suggestion that we also have is around posting things um, mm. to the po at the post office, um, at places where you think right. um, communities may gather, or yes. excuse me, yeah, not gather, absolutely. but you know, in the general yeah. course of their day, actually, yeah. in the doctor's surgery. Um, yeah, very true. Yeah, mail, mail drops as well as another. Mail one, drops, but, indeed. Yeah. Indeed, some very good um, questions and discussions coming there. Yeah, so I, I, I think that that takes us to the end of our session, um, David, and thank you so much again uh, to everyone for joining us for today's webinar. We do hope you've enjoyed our session. As I said, special thanks to our guest, uh, Mr. David Younger. Thank you so much again for your advice and, and the presentation. Just a reminder that this webinar was recorded and, we'll, and we will send you a link to the recording. All the resources mentioned in today's session, as well as the survey, just seeking your feedback to help us uh, improve our content and delivery. Uh, if you are on LinkedIn, I would encourage you to join us at the Disaster Recovery Practitioners Australia group uh, to continue the conversation. Now, the purpose of the group is to share information about the practice of disaster recovery for community members, local governments, local organisations, schools, businesses, amongst others. And there are many people who are going to face being a recovery manager for the first time, even if disaster recovery is nowhere near their job title. 
Australian Red Cross also supports the Disaster Recovery Advisors and Mentors Australia program aimed at supporting communities impacted by disasters to drive their own recovery. This is where we link trained volunteer mentors who have previous personal experience in disaster recovery and we link those with people's um, community leaders and workers. You may be a recovery officer, a school principal from local council, a community service organisation or an emerging community leader and you're currently in the midst of recovery and we connect you with mentors to discuss and address the challenges posed by the disaster recovery process. The mentoring aims to help community leaders avoid unnecessary pitfalls, help normalise the recovery experience, but equally allows mentors to share their experience, provide support and act as a bit of a sounding board. Now, if you are interested for further information on the pro program, please email us here at the National Recovery Team at recovery at redcross.org.au. Now, this was one of a series of disaster recovery webinars, so please keep an eye out for upcoming webinars. And thank you so much all for joining us. And until next webinar, thank you and goodbye. Thank you.